Hey, it's Joey Casada. You're listening to Tom and Zeus on Shout It Out Loudcast. If you want to hear two idiots with Boston accents talk about Kiss, you've definitely come to the right place. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the Shout It Out Loudcast. Don't turn your radio dial. You're in the right place because it's time for another bonus episode. Episode number seven. We're calling this one, If You Want True Peace of Mind, You Probably Should Be Listening to a Different Podcast. Zeus, Tom, how are you? Good morning, my friend. What's up, everybody? How are you? What a perfect uh, Saturday morning in uh, mid-June to talk about Iron Maiden. Did you just go, good morning? (laughs) Good morning. How are you? Going to ask a bunch of questions about Iron Maiden. (laughs) Who is the lead singer of Iron Maiden? (laughs) Here we go. It's starting already. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Started early. Yeah, absolutely. Nice, beautiful Saturday morning. I'm well over here. I'm anxious to get this one started. And you guys are like, why are you so anxious? Like, we can push this off another week. I'm like, no, because I'm up next. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're not excited because you want to talk about this. You're excited because you want to just move on. (laughs) Yeah, so we can get to Tanya Tucker. Uh, (laughs) And we're doing, like, photos of her in, like, the 70s and 80s. Yeah, but she's looking a little rough right now, but that's okay. But she was looking good. <laughs> hey, she was looking good, son. <laughs> oh, boy. So uh, what, what, what are we doing this week? We're doing Iron Maiden Peace of Mind? That's right. Yep. And whose oh, pick is this? We're doing, we're doing Who's, Peace of Mind? I hope so. <laughs> whose pick is this? We're doing, no, we're doing Power Slave. <laughs> Did you remember? <laughs> Power Slave's a great album. My pick, my pick, because I want to, uh, Maiden's one of my top 10 bands of all time, so I want to do a Maiden album. Cool. Nice. Awesome. All right. All right, so that's our show. <laughs> uh, good <laughs> night. See you Thank next you. time. Good night. <laughs> that's all we have to say about Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> we all the our silence. Silence. Good job. I, I, I've never heard us three be quiet at the same time. What the people, fuck? There's a lot of people out there that are like, oh, that, that's the best part of the podcast. <laughs> Silence for three seconds. <laughs> oh, All man. right. What did we do last time? We did my pick last time, which was Metallica Load and got, as expected, very, very interesting feedback. Um, and that's kind of the reason why I picked that album. So let, let's get into a little bit of the feedback here. So we got some people from uh, Podchaser who left some reviews, which is great. Vaults are us or Vaults Russ. I don't know what is how he goes by, but he left a great five star one. He said, uh, this podcast is getting better with every episode. The albums are not always great, but the conversation makes it worth listening to. The poem had me gut wrenching laughing. All right, that's a good one. And then we had another one from Casa de Leon, another one on Pod Chaser, five stars. He said, uh, love these bonus episodes. This album is great. Good pick, Tommy. Ooh, thank you. That being said, the rankings were shit, except the guy that had King Nothing at number one. The guy? How many people are on this show? <laughs> um, so we appreciate those those five-star rankings and obviously the feedback as well. Sonny, what else have we got? Emails? Yeah, we got some emails. Uh, one said, uh, just listen to the load episode again. Great fun. Also bit the bullet and ordered myself a toy from Adam and Eve. Oh, God. Played with it twice, and damn, I feel good. Oh, God, no. I would say on the load episode, Tommy's pick were the worst, <laughs> but I'm in a state of euphoria right now, so who knows? Time for bed. Peace out, Girl Scout. 
Oh. Now, is this a man or woman? Is I need to know this before. Right? That's Mac Maddie. That that's our buddy Mac Maddie. So uh, God bless Mac Maddie. There's usually something about alcohol with him, and that he's got to go. He, he, as though he's on the phone with us. He is. Ah, oh, I gotta hang. I gotta hang up. <laughs> You're writing to us, buddy. Stop. You don't have to tell us. Uh, Jerry Blackwell says, uh, "Did Tommy rank until it sleeps at number ten? Yes. What the- fuck yes his rankings were not good mine would have been much closer to Sonny's. thank you although i'm not wait although i'm afraid that makes me a music hater <laughs> the whole "ooh, i'm a tiger by zeus was hilarious great discussion on this one time to pick a bon jovi album bon jovi holy shit maybe i'm a music hater oh well you never know bon jovi could be down the line there's a lot to get to Doug Uh-oh. Middleton writes, My Hot Load. Load album is pretty oh. rough, but you guys made the podcast so good, I might actually listen to it again. Oh, no, wait. That I actually did listen to it again. And yeah, it's still shit. <laughs> <laughs> you should try a country album. Would ha- love to hear the absolute hate Hollywood would have. Keep up the great work. I enjoyed this podcast, and I'll leave the rest alone. Exactly. Um, all right. Serial. Is it Serial Man? Serial Man? I don't know. Although the name, oh wait, although the load, <laughs> although, although the album is a load of shit, <laughs> the podcast was great, hilarious and funny and took my mind off things for a while. Thanks for that. Loving the bonus episodes. Please do a Night Ranger album. Yes. Oh, all right. That, that's, that definitely, be- that's definitely Sonny's alter ego there. Oh, oh man. Man. <laughs> It's got to be a Bay Area Twitter brother. stuff. Yeah. 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 What was that, Sonny? I said it's got to be a Bay Area brother. Yeah, yeah, Night Ranger. Oh, good band. So I we've got the usual suspects come back, and uh, Twisted Kister gives us his, um, you know, his top ten list. He starts with Hero of the Day, and it looks like he ends with the Outlaw Torn. Tom, oh how how? Oh, what's the matter with you people? I know, but you know the great thing is I, I love when we get things like you know one he was texting, um, excuse me, tweeting with us. Uh, a lot about this episode, but he does say like this episode has made me listen to this album five to six times in the past few days. I, I, we love hearing that. I mean, this is the whole mm-hmm. point of doing podcasts and things like that. I love that you pick this album of all the albums because it's challenging kind of people like, Hey, go check this out. You might not know it, or you might not be uh, as fond of it as the other albums, but this is why I like it. Why don't you give me a chance? And you're trying to convince people to you know, to uh, hear the type of music that you think works and maybe they'll change their minds. So I love when we see things like that. Um, (laughs) Our good buddy Murph. Murph jumps in. Is great. Listen, gents. Zeus, I hope you add Waylon Jennings to the album review rotation. (laughs) Hey, you never know. (laughs) Yeah, I think that would be the last we hear of um, Sonny, if that was the case. Um, Didn't he do the Dukes of Hazard? Just a- yes. Okay. So as long Just as I got a picture of Daisy Duke to look at every time I'm oh. pissed off, I'm good. <laughs> I think this one is uh, Todd Herrig, right? So I was a kid in the 80s who grew up with their first records and was infatuated with the best metal band of the decade. Hadn't even heard this album in its entirety. I gave the podcast a listen because of you guys, but you were unable to convert me. Thrash <laughs> Metallica, please. Okay, well, fair, it, it fair enough. Sometimes or doesn't. Yep. Uh, Jack Skeleton wrote load of, and it's a poop emoji, or lo- or is it a load of question mark? I actually don't mind load. However, I wouldn't wipe Lars' ass with Saint Anger. Oh, yeah. Still want my back the wasted time I spent listening to it once. Yeah, uh, that's a tough. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Deuce writes, wow, I had no idea about the background of the album cover. Agree. Disgusting. Disgusting. Uh, Pearl Jam is not what Metallica fans were looking for. Uh, Mm -hmm. My hardcore Metallica fans didn't like the changes to the logo or their appearance. Save rock and metal. Zeus had the best ranking, but I edited it a bit. I'm hoping to hear. I'm hoping to hear something. I'm hoping to hear something that interests me. I'm praying to give. 
I'm praying to give a flying. I'm praying to give a flying fuck for goodness sake. <laughs> that was my poem. <laughs> oh, God. said. Oh, you guys are awful. Um, someone texted, put a photo of Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Oh, yeah. The two oh, by four. Two by four. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, the, the usual suspects, Steve gives us his, uh, top, uh, I was gonna say top 10, but it was top 14, uh, King nothing was his number one and mama said number 14. Okay. Um, Zandon black, right. I've never heard this album. <laughs> Good. Well, may- maybe but listen to it and, you know, we'll listen to your review first and then decide. Smoke Show 19, 95.4%. I don't know where he came up with that percentage. Specific. of this album is complete shit. (laughs) I wouldn't have even bothered ranking the songs, and the cover is just sick. I suggest listen to A7X. Avenge Sevenfold. Oh, is that what he's saying? I'm like, I don't know the acronym. Uh, Instead, all that said, it was a fun listen. These three must be best friends. Maybe. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't even know if I like these guys. Who was that? Yeah, Yeah. unfollow that dude. (laughs) Smoke Show 19. And then he followed it up by saying, no more live streams by you guys? Nah, that'll be coming. Yep. Sean McNair wrote, need some more love for Mama Said. I agree. Um, Sean McNair, the the quarterback? (laughs) That's Steve McNair. Oh, the Sean's his brother. Isn't he dead? Yes, rest in peace. (laughs) Yeah, he decided to write back from the dead about and to talk about a, a KISS podcast discussing Metallica's load. Yeah. Uh, God. L. N. Smithy, in parentheses, I remember a letter written to a fan magazine by a former Metallica fan who said he was pissed that they cut their hair since he grew his long because of theirs. What a betrayal. Oh, and then finally, a couple of retweets, uh, Bill Elam. The great Bill Elam wrote a great review of a great album, and I don't care what it sounds like or what it doesn't. So nice, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you know the, the rest of them are the usual suspects going back and forth. But we got a lot of feedback on this, Tom. So yep. great pick on this. We got a couple couple things to to wrap up on the feedback from Facebook. Our buddy Nicholas Gratton, glad to finally hear you review some Metallica. Mick Watkins, Load is a great album. Can't wait for this episode. Rick Rare says, my favorite Metallica album. This should be good. Wow. Uh, Sean Hammond said, I just finished listening. This is my least favorite Metallica record, but listening to the episode was really great for giving me a new perspective. I listened to the record after your show. Now you need to do Reload. I actually really like Reload, too. What else do we got? Kevin Jepsen, how do fuckos love this album? Metallica was my gateway to everything metal. I was 21 when this came out, and I didn't feel the hate that most fans did. Okay, first off, my God, Sonny Pooney, I'm going to slap the Y and T off your face <laughs> next time I see you. <laughs> um, Chuck Hoskins says, I want a St. Anger episode now. Well, you're going to have to wait for that, my friend. That ain't happening. <laughs> we push the envelope with load. We ain't pushing the envelope with St. Anger. If you can't hear the anger, you ain't listening hard enough. Uh, Trust yeah. me, there's enough anger in this already. <laughs> Twisted Kister said this episode had me listen to this album five to six times in the past few days. That's one thing about the bonus shows. It's usually albums I haven't spent much time on. Uh, I said that's what makes these bonus episodes cool to hear someone else's passion on something that I'm not too familiar with. Just, you know, great stuff. We appreciate all that feedback, and it's awesome. That's why why we do this. So thank you, everybody, for reaching out and talking to us about this. Oh, we had a poll. Yes, we did um, best song. We picked four. We picked the Outlaw Torn, Until It Sleeps, Ain't My Bitch, and King Nothing. King Nothing was the winner with 39%, and then the other three were right around 20, 20-ish percent. So not a, well, I, I guess you could call it a runaway, but King Nothing was the winner. Sonny wins again. Sonny <laughs> wins again. Yep. That's because nobody wanted to vote for Ain't My Bitch. My Bitch. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, the weather's getting nice. It's getting a little hot. And because it's getting a little hot, what do you got to do there, Mr. Pooney? Oh, boy. Well, you know, we got to help our partners at adamandeve.com. So free stuff is awesome. But free stuff to spice up your bedroom is even better. Select almost any one item for 50% off. And then 
Adam and Eve loads on the free stuff. Enter promo code LOUDCAST to check out and get 10 tantalizing free gifts, a sexy item for him, a special gift for her, and a third item you'll both enjoy, and six free spicy movies, plus free shipping. That's promo code LOUDCAST at adamandeve.com. Nice. Beautiful. Excellent. Well, when we do that, we go right into the album. So this is Iron Maiden's Peace of Mind. Sonny, this was your pick. So what we usually do is we start off first. We talk about, you know, how we got introduced to the album and what it means to us. And why don't you lead us off? Yeah, so... Like I said before, Iron Maiden is one of my top 10 bands, and normally I'm not into the operatic Dungeons & Dragons metal, that's for sure. Nerd! Nerd! But uh, I think it's a combination of the music, Bruce's voice, and Eddie that kind of got me interested. So I came in at Somewhere in Time, and Somewhere in Time is actually my favorite album. It's just like saying Load is people's metallic, you know, favorite metallic album. People don't really like Somewhere in Time if you're a Maiden fan. And then they were on MTV all the time, right? Because they were kind of the first uh, new wave of British heavy metal that, uh, besides Def Leppard, of course, that got a lot of airplay on MTV. So it seemed like they were on like every couple hours in between Duran Duran and, you know, what, uh, Madonna and Hall and & Oates and whatever else you could find on there. So then, you know, after kind of falling in love with a song like Wasted Years off of Somewhere in Time, I just went backward and backwards and discovered it all. And this is not my favorite album, but uh, it's definitely, well, and the other thing, I think I've said it before, although I love Iron Maiden, I don't have one single Iron Maiden album that is a Desert Island album for me. There is always a song that I'm like, really? Can we yep. just, come on, dude. Is that song really about X? I'll save it. <laughs> is that song really about X? Really? That's where you had to go with this? Um, but, you know, I'm not a reader, so I get all my history from Iron Maiden songs. <laughs> <laughs> nice. How about you, Tommy? Uh, so... Iron Maiden, peace of mind for me. <clears throat> I speci- I have pretty pretty specific memories of this because, so I, I think I may have mentioned this before on uh, you know the, the GNR and you know Def Leppard and White Snake episode. So I have a sister who's four years older than me, and surprisingly, you know, we we listen to everything. Like you know, we were listening to you know Prince and rap music and metal and everything. And Number of the Beast was the album that came out prior to Peace of Mind and. My sister had that cassette, and I got into it. And of course, at that age, like Sonny said, Eddie is just—I mean, you, you think Kiss, you think Kiss album covers bring you in as a kid. The Eddie, the Iron Maiden albums are just insane. So, Number of the Beast, and then Peace of Mind, and then um, you know, I love love those videos because it mixed the performances with like those historical, you know, the black and white, especially the Number of the Beast and um, excuse me, the Run to the Hills video, fantastic. And then this album came out, and then. Flight of Icarus was kind of like their attempt at making like a like a mid tempo hit type of song, which is unusual for for them. And that song actually really pulled me into Iron Maiden even more. I got the cassette because around this time, hair metal wasn't really kind of a thing, so I was listening to like Ozzy, uh, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, some you know that kind of stuff, and then. I kind of drifted away from Iron Maiden just because then the hair metal stuff started to get into it. And Metallica started to put out a couple more albums that were a little bit more accessible to me at my age. Um, but this album, I haven't heard it in a really long time other than the hits. So I was excited to go back and revisit it. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that. But peace of mind is definitely, you know, it, it's, it's one of those kind of historic albums for, for a reason, even if you're really not an Iron Maiden fan, I think. Okay. Zeus. So, like you guys, uh, MTV saw the videos, the Run to the Hills, the Trooper and stuff. So, we're looking at 83. 83, I was 10 years old. Um, I've talked about this before. Like, so, when I was younger, I would go, my family, we'd go back to Greece every other summer. So, my first time there, I was 10. Uh, You have to understand, there's a, you know, for us, we're kind of blind to this. But in Europe... Music is a is is way different. I all of a sudden saw for the first time a shitload of Iron Maiden shirts. 
yep. the kids from Greece. Like, so they're learning like British and European bands. And we're all, I'm all, I'm thinking like Iron Maiden, why are they so big here? And I would see theirs, their shirts. I would see Scorpions, Priest, but Iron Maidens was more. Um, I remembered, you know, the Trooper when it came out. <clears throat> I remembered uh, the video. I never bought this. I don't own any Iron Maiden music other than their greatest hits, whatever it is that, that I have. And I know all the hits. It's nothing that, like, I'm like, ugh, Iron Maiden. It was always just, yeah, I like their songs, but I never got into them. I just never did. And so when Sonny says, let's do Peace of Mind, I ordered it. <laughs> and I got the CD. And I went through it. So even songs that I know the titles to, When Eagles Dare, um, and Flight of Icarus, I know of them, but I never heard them. <laughs> so this was my first time here. I know the shirts. I know the covers of their singles, yep. but I never heard the song. That's how popular the image of Iron Maiden is. So this was all new to me. Uh, and I got, a, you know, I got a pretty fair amount of stuff to say about it. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I oh, go ahead, Sonny. I was going to say, Eddie, that whole visual element, I mean, bright colors, skull, right? It's got rebel written all over it. And Derek Riggs is an outstanding artist. I mean, this stuff's all over my man cave here. And, uh, because of the artwork, I've got every Iron Maiden song on MP3. I got it on CD. I have it on vinyl. I've got picture discs. I've got figurines. I mean, this merchandising machine that was created is just ridiculous. And if you are a high school kid, I would say between 83 and maybe 89, Iron Maiden shirts were all over the place. And the other thing they did great was they would tour around and they would make a California shirt and a Texas shirt and an Arizona shirt, right? So the Arizona shirt may be Eddie coming out of Sun Devil Stadium, right? And, uh, uh, the Texas shirt might be, you know, a Lone Star State thing with Eddie with the right colors. You know that Derek just did a great job of that stuff. It's the merchandising machine part of it. it's unbelievable. Speaking of the T-shirts, I have a hilarious story here, and our buddy Murph, who who will listen to this, I know he's not an Iron Maiden fan, but hopefully he'll check this episode and remember this story a little bit. So, I was a freshman in high school uh, in '87, uh, and I played freshman football. So it was the fall of 87 and I, 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 I'm going to admit, I don't even know what, what Iron Maiden album was, was out at that time. But I know that even in 87, I know that peace of mind, number of the beast power slave, they were all popular. In time. Okay. So we had a kid on our team, funny, funny kid. And he's calling me all night. He's keeping me up there. He's a funny little kid. He's telling me he's got all kinds of problems now. He can't sleep. So he's touching himself and pulling at his pants. What's the problem up there, Shelly? But he was like, at that time, it was unusual to see like a 14-year-old metal head, like a legitimate metal head, not hair metal, <laughs> like metal. And we had a practice one day, and he either never got a practice jersey or never or forgot it at home. So he came out to freshman football practice after school, <laughs> helmet, shoulder pads, with a Power Slave t-shirt stretched <laughs> over his shoulder pads. <laughs> and we get out on the field, and he's like, what's the matter? I love Iron Maiden. Everyone's like, yeah, but you're never going to be able to wear that again when you take it off of your shoulder pads. He's like, well, I don't care. He's like, I'll just get another one. And I'll, always, I'll never forget that. I know Murph knows who I'm talking about. It was one of the funniest things I've, I've ever remembered. And like you said, Sonny, we're all like you know, 13, 14 years old. And, and like, again... For for kids in the seventies with Kiss, that's how it was with kids in the eighties with Iron Maiden and these graphics, these album covers are just and just Eddie in general, they just un and they get they get even better. They as the albums progress, they just get more insane. But just real quick, kind of saying what Zeus said, I'm I'm like an Iron Maiden like hits guy. I don't have I don't really own any of their albums. Like I don't really know their their deep cuts. I know like peace of mind. I know you know the Trooper. Flight of Icarus and Where Eagles Dare. So I was kind of interested and excited to listen to this album because I'm, I've never gotten into those off, you know, those deep cuts. So, yeah. So what else? <laughs> All right. So that, well, wraps it, that, that wraps it up. So we want to talk, we want to get into the cover, and the, uh, especially on this one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
So on this album cover, oh, so- Sonny has the album. I have the CD. Tom, you can't show us your MP3, can you? Yeah, I, ha- I have neither. So <laughs> I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the artwork on my phone. So what I like is let's let, actually let's start with the you know obviously the first the visual and this one is another photo of Eddie. He looks like he's supposedly was lobotomized and he's in a straight jacket and he's in a rubber room <laughs> yep. and uh, looking menacing. The big Iron Maiden, you know, red logo right up top and peace of mind, you know, right underneath it, which is uh, basically a homonym. Homonym. Did I say it right. correctly? Homonym. Peace. Which yep. means, yeah, peace of mind, like. P-E-A, and then yep. peace, like his brain. Yep. So, interesting stuff. What do you guys think? Why does yeah. he have to be chained in a rubber room? Is that how crazy he is? I'm nutty. I'm a crazy kind of guy. Yeah, I can hear that. Like he might hurt himself in a rubber room? To protect himself, but not not only is he chained to the wall, but he's chained to the floor. He's got that around his neck, and then it's chained to the floor of the room. But, Sonny, go ahead with your thoughts on the cover. No, I think the cover's great. Um... Actually, you know, if you were to, and I'm sure we'll do this in the future, we'll look at more Iron Maiden covers. This is one of the few that doesn't have a lot of colors in it, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, Iron Maiden colors pop off the absolute artwork. And this one's a little more dry, a little more basic, but it works. There's no doubt. And I love the glow in Eddie's eyes. It's like, I'm ready to bust out of this place and kill somebody. Yeah, this this cover you know it's un it's unusual because well, first of all a lot of the times you see Eddie he's got like that like long gray like stringy hair you know and he looks this one's even just cr- I think this one just achieves a different level because not only is he bald but you can see that his skull's been like split open and there's like a little like a hint like a bolt like a bracket you know to keep the top of his skull to the rest of his head well my head was dashed apart and um and 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 he looks just insane, like you said, the glowing eyes and like the little piece, the little bit of blood dripping down the forehead. It's just, I mean, if you're a little kid, not even a little kid, but you're a teenager, you're like I'm buying this record. I don't even give a fuck what the music sounds like because this cover is insane looking. Okay, is it insane, insane, crazy. Um, and and it really is. It's, and you're right, Sonny. There really are no colors. It's it's pretty much like one color, you know. Um, but it's interesting because as menacing and as crazy as the album cover is, it's kind of weird how peace of mind is written in like a nice little script. You know, it's not like it's like blood dripping font or anything kind of my teeth gum is dripping blood. I cannot even blow bubbles when I chew gum when I drive cab. It's like a very like peaceful, and maybe that's the dichotomy of the whole thing of peace of mind. It's like a very calmly written cursive title. Yeah, you might want a Hahnemann uh, dichotomy. Like we might want to tone the words down a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, can we get with the? Well, and well, well. well it, it's funny that you say that, Zeus, because we're recording on Saturday the thirteenth. So today was new episode drop day for our regular show, and somebody called us buffoons <laughs> <laughs> as a compliment. So that's why I'm glad we're using words like homonym, dichotomy. I've no, lo- I've looked up yeah. I looked up these words. I have my thesaurus right next to me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's so next what, what, to my dinosaurus. Wait uh, a second, save it, save it, save that, save it. What, what about the back cover? What about taping? Nothing. Yeah, huh? I'm sorry, you know. Yeah, I hear you, fruitcake. You got to help me out, though, if you could. I would. Well, Sonny, actually, you have the you have the gatefolds. Zeus, uh, do you have the gatefold, too, with the CD? Okay, yeah. so you guys can talk about that, because I don't have that. But go ahead. So the inside is uh, the maiden guy is having, well, they're basically sitting down for a meal, and there's a vegetable tray with a brain in it. And what's interesting is, the four guys are looking at the brain because somebody told them to, but Bruce decided to look at the camera oh, instead. God. <laughs> they printed it anyway and notice Bruce has got like a bitten apple on a knife. <laughs> Ooh, that's so tough. That's so Ooh, badass. That William Tell, like he's William yeah. Tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just uh, now at least they don't got makeup on like fucking Lars and shit, but uh, it's a pretty good look picture. Yeah, nice. Yeah. 
the other thing, Sonny, is if you look at my CD, I'm sure obviously this wasn't original. I don't know if you can see it. The oh, yeah. CD itself is a brain. Yeah, that's pretty kick-ass. It basically looks like what that plate looks like. Yep. Um, that That's what it is. Lyrics are on here, which is always great, you know, so you don't have to go to Google. This is, you know, if you bought the CD years ago before the Internet. There's a, you know, album. There's a, excuse me, a photo of the band looking like they're near the ocean, probably where they film, where they um, recorded the album in the Bahamas. So maybe it's there, but they look like kids from the eighties, metal heads from the eighties. They look dumb. like, they, they look like those guys. If anybody out there is familiar, Sonny Zeus, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but that video heavy metal parking lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. One yeah. of the greatest video. They look like guys that were in that video and, and, and they just look like that early. And that's the, that's the big difference when you talk about, early 80s hard rock and metal and then late 80s like hard rock and hair metal you know like that, that when you when, when you show somebody that picture you're like oh that's early 80s that's that's pre-84 that that picture you can tell you can just tell yeah and the back of the album has a verse from <laughs> the, from revelations so what was happening if you can remember back in 83, uh, you know, Kiss wasn't the only one dealing with Knights and Satan service, right? These guys had just come off 666, the number of the beast, right? Yep. So you got every protester out there. And the back of the album says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more brain, I'm supposed to say pain there, Wow, for the former things uh for the former things are passed away. So basically right out of the gate, these guys plus Mer Martin Birch were, we're going to make fun of this devil worship thing that everybody thinks we're on. And yep. it was only the U S that was doing it to them. Really? There were nobody else was doing it to them. It was just the U S right. Yeah. There's a, also a photo of Derek, Dr. Death Riggs, uh, Martin black Knight Birch. They're basically in night costumes. Uh, in the album, I don't know if you. I assume you have that in the album as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, they, you know, they thank people at the end of this. They always they have that to Mastercard. They thank as one. No synthesizers or alternative ulterior motives. Very special thanks to Clive Burr. Good luck, mate. To all the headbangers, earth dogs, hell rats, and rivet heads everywhere. Thanks. Come on, you irons. Wow. Uh, and that was the drummer that they kind of booted out or left. And then my horsey, when he got scared, he booted me across the barn because he was angry with the birds. So whatever, when he had a breakdown of some sort. Yep. So and yeah. don't forget and, and don't and take a look at the back cover, because I actually think the back cover is kind of interesting because so the front cover shows Eddie inside the padded cell. Yeah. The back cover shows the padded cell with the door open. But he's, it's all clouds, so the padded cell is like in the sky. And then if you look next to the door, next to the padded, next to the door, there's a hand reaching out, almost look like a robed hand. And in the hand is some kind of medallion or metal or chain or something. So you're getting real friggin' interesting here with with with, with whatever the mythology they're trying to portray here. But I, I think it's just awesome, Sonny. Now. You tell us a little bit about the artist and the person that does all this stuff. I think you you know a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, uh, Derek Riggs, right? So uh, obviously, incredible artist. Uh, I think I'm not sure he has the whole story kind of figured out. I think what he does is he has a skeleton of a story. He goes and paints whatever he's going to paint or draw, and he has some thoughts about, hey, we should have a floating hand, and it should have a medallion, and blah, blah, blah. Just enough to get the skeleton of the story out. And then everybody draw their own conclusions, right? He'll throw some stuff in there. So like, you can you can spend a whole day going to Eddie Pictures and going, oh, I wonder if that means that. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if that means that. Ooh, I'm a tiger. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, they had a falling out for a little bit. He came back. I don't exactly know where their relationship is now. Derek sells stuff on his own website. He's got a book out there with a bunch of drawings that he's done. He's drawn stuff for other people. Um, but uh, it, they're iconic. Like the trooper drawing? Come on. I mean, this thing is iconic, yep. right? There's absolutely no doubt. People know this drawing, and they've not heard one Iron Maiden song. 
this is <laughs> my my daughters are starting to do it now at high school. They'll see somebody wearing like a Nirvana shirt or whatever or a Guns N' Roses tee and they'll like, name one Nirvana song. Like, Who's Nirvana? <laughs> On your shirt, stupid. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Exactly. I believe that. Yep. It's so, true. That's a that's a nice breakdown of the album cover. Let's get into the little bit of the specifics of the album. So the album was uh, recorded in Bahamas, NASA Compass Point Studios. And I guess a lot of artists, you know, record there. They did uh, Back in Black, ACDC did theirs in there. Uh, and then they later mixed it at Electric Lady Studios in New York. We're all familiar with that record place. It was released May 16th, 1983. Iron Maiden's fourth studio album, the second with Bruce, first with Nico. And the classic Iron Maiden lineup is formed. So you got Bruce Dickinson, Dave Murray, Adrian Smith doing the guitars. Steve Harris, of course, on bass. Nico McBride on drums. The album was produced by Martin Birch. Now, I believe Martin Birch would be the second. This is the second album we've done of his on this podcast. He did slide yes, it in. He did slide it in. That's right. That's right. So, that, so he's the first yep. duplicate. Technically, right. right? Yep. And I, I bet uh, nobody predicted that. <laughs> no, no. It's released on EMI <laughs> Records in United Kingdom, Capitol Records in the U.S., Platinum in both U.K. and U.S. It peaked at number three in the U.K., 14 in the U.S. So this is 1983. This is kind of our little bit of our wheelhouse this era. You know, I think uh, well, Pyromania came out at this time, and I think Slide It In was a little bit later, correct? Yeah, a year yes. later. Yep. Okay. So, but, I mean, that's the era, and that's three British bands <laughs> at that time, right? Well, at the time, this is when, the like we talked about, this is when the new wave of British heavy metal was taken over the America, when Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. Um, We're not doing a Saxon one next, are we? Fuck no. Saxon, <laughs> one of the 83 albums that don't have one single good song? Sure. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> But but the land the landscape of rock was different this time. I mean, you still you still had you know Kiss putting out records and Van Halen and, and you know the American Aerosmith doing stuff. But but it was things were starting to change a little bit. And th- those British bands were making their mark. So um, anything else, guys, or were you ready to go into the songs? Um, I'll 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 save my my some of my other commentary as we get through through the the, the tracks. But I have some specific things to say about the band and this and this album and whatever. But we'll talk about that as the songs progress. So no, <laughs> no right now, but yes, for the future. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So guys, uh, let's start this off where Eagles dare the best four second drum intro ever. Um, what Bruce was kind of going for, he wanted something that was kind of stargazer by rainbow, very cozy Powell, get that drum feel. So br- it was kind of Bruce's idea to do this whole drum thing. And they had to inter- introduce Nico, because Clyde Burr was gone. This was his first album. And depending on who you believe, Steve says drank, uh, Clive drank too much and was unreliable. And, you know, you got to have the bass player and the drummer work together. I mean, there's no way around that. Clive says, Dad died. I left the band for two weeks, came back, lost my job. So it depends on who you believe, I guess. But uh, Paul Diano was kind of booted for the same thing, right? The drinking was getting too crazy. The partying was getting too crazy. And what I mean by too crazy is these guys were all partying. So there's absolutely no doubt about that. They say that over and over. Even the album name came up. They were drunk in a bar somewhere. And somebody said, ah, peace of mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, Where where Eagles Dare, uh, based on a movie about World War II, massive guitars. uh, You know, the drum feels really creative. Um, Record company didn't want to open with a drum intro. I could tell you that. So... Uh, but uh, Steve Harris shut that down pretty quick. Supposedly, the song was done in two takes, and that's that's kind of amazing to me. What's interesting is Bruce stopped singing, and then for three and a half minutes, <laughs> there's no more Bruce. So you better bring a lunch because that three and a half minutes seems to last forever. I'm not sure. And good luck figuring out the lyrics. Thank God they put them in the album because you cannot understand really what Bruce is saying. I like the song, though. So that's a good segue, Sonny, because I'm going to ma- I'm going to say this now and say it once. But Sonny said during this song, there's three and a half minutes where Bruce doesn't sing. 
Those are probably the best three minutes of the song. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and I'm gonna get it out. The, I'm, I, I, I'm gonna get it out. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna get it out there. This right is now. a this is gonna be a long review for you. Then no no. I'm I'm gonna get it out there right now. This is one of the reasons why at right now I'm not a huge Iron Maiden fan. Why I'm not a huge fan of these kinds of band musically. The album absolutely rips. I mean, this band is tighter than a drum no pun intended the band but i can't get into dickinson's operatic vocals a lot of his high-pitched wails and howls it, it's not my style i prefer i prefer a lot like the the metal that i listen to to be kind of like like angry you know like james hetfield or you know or phil from pantera you know just kind of growly and menacing and i understand that the, the, the iron maiden's made a career bruce dickinson put them into the stratosphere with this it his vocals are just not my style um that's a lot of the reason why i really don't like judas priest i'm not a big fan of, of halford's vocal stylings either but that being said you know the song rips um it's great there's one thing on this song there's a couple songs that do this and this is one of them and i don't know why certain bands do it maybe our friend tony from restrained who did the intro to this episode he's in a band he's a guitarist maybe he can offer some insight but i notice on this album and some other metal metal albums i listen to where the lead guitar and the bass are going along side by side so it sounds it's, it's one sound as opposed to say another song where the bass and the drums are in the background keeping the groove and the lead guitarist is kind of doing his own thing this particular song and there's a few other ones where they're all pl- they're all doing the exact same thing so it sounds like one sound I don't like, I don't, that's not something I'm a huge fan of either. Uh, maybe, you know, like I said, our buddy Tony or anybody out there, maybe that's a technique or a style that musicians use for certain songs, but I notice it in this and settle down with the machine gun sounds. You fucking what's it, the theme to call of duty? Relax. Fucking, you know, and, and, and one thing Zeus, I, I know we always talk about how Dio, you know, we talk about like dungeons and dragons metal <laughs> iron maiden. I'm going to create a new genre. Iron Maiden is the history channel metal. <laughs> or, I mean, and, and this is not the first history lesson we're going to get on this album. <laughs> yeah, but, sorry. We're too smart for you. We're sorry. I want my metal to talk about death, addiction, you know, all horrible things. Not this, but I'm just, but that, that's, what I'm joking talking about. about. We do a kiss podcast. What does kiss talk about that shit? Well, they don't talk about. Well, we'll get it. All right. What does Kiss talk about? So well, throw that other part into it. But that's a, that's a good point. That's a good point because Iron Maiden and especially and, and also Rush, the Iron Maiden. There are no girls going to Rush or Iron Maiden concerts. <laughs> okay, the, no one is getting laid listening to Rush or Iron Maiden. And I know you two hate Rush. There is not a huge difference it, lyrically and even compositionally with a so, with a lot of these songs and what Rush does, and we'll we'll get into that as we go along. But that I kind of wanted to make my blanket statement about the band in general with with where Eagles Dare. It is a good song, I will say that musically it kicks ass. Okay, so I will admit that you are correct that Bruce Dickinson's vocals and things like that is something you have to kind of get used to, but you gotta respect him. Absolutely, respect I, do. Well, no, I do. Range, I do that. that vocal ability how the fuck do you compare that with that fucking walking crow human crow called getty lee in that voice oh no his voice is terrible compare them i'm I'm not comparing him getty lee's voice is is tough to listen to too i agree i I mean rush is a mount rushmore band for me and i I agree that the weakest link is probably getty's voice i give you that yeah. I give so you that. the weakest link of all their music is the singing. <laughs> it's the same thing. With, it's the same thing with Iron Maiden. Second is the songs. Oh, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> wait, wait. That, see, that's that's interesting because Sonny, you love Iron Maiden and you hate Rush, but they're not the same. How can they're you compare not, the vocals? The same. They're not even close. The vocals are way different. Oh no, I know, I know, I know, I know. I get it. I, get I, it. I can Go see ahead. the music and the capability, but you make a great point, Tom. So here's the other part I'm going to say. So we're starting off with the first song. So before I kind of get into the song, I'll give you, like, it will be so cliche by the time I go to song number nine to keep saying the same thing. I am blown away by the music ability of this band. Blown Absolutely. away. Yep. The vocals are off the charts. The lyrics are something that they want to say, whether it's corny or anything like that. I'm saying get some pussy. 
And you won't be so horny. And your songs won't be so corny. They put thought into it, and it's something they want to say. They're not what we just reviewed, Trouble Walking. I am sad, now I am, now I am bad, and now I'm glad. You know, they're not that stupid stupidity. Um, the drums are off the charts. And, you know, the guitars, the dual guitars, I don't know who's playing what. I'm not that big of a Maiden fan to know who the difference is. But I can tell you both of them are off the charts. It's insane. The harmony that they both do together and then the leads. Just watching videos along the way and watching live clips of all these songs. I am blown. I'm like, holy shit, that looks like Eddie Van Halen shit. And then all of a sudden he'll do something different that looks like freaking Richie Blackmore shit. That yep. looks like, I'm like, holy Christ. And then guess what? It switches over. Now Dave Murray's doing it. And, and then, you know, you go back to Adrian Smith. You're like, holy fuck, this is incredible. But the one main thing that I want to talk about, and that is, is there anybody better than Steve Harris? Holy shit. That. That sound and that, you know, I knew of this sound before I even, like, knew what Iron Maiden was, really, in the 80s. That galloping sound that they do in all their songs. Every, and that's why all their videos that when, they, when I was young and I first saw Run to the Hills and I saw The Trooper and those videos, that old clip of that movie, and I know we're talking where Eagles Dare, and they're all on horses, that's it's awesome. Where's your perfect yep. of what they're sounding you <clears throat> yep. feel like you're on a horse charging into battle listening to this music yep that's insane the music ability so i don't even care if there if there's no singing i don't care if his singing is kind of bad it's incredible so i can't i don't think there's anything on this album that i don't like because it's just so talented it's so off the charts this begins with the drums, and it just blows you away. Imagine being in a concert with this, listening to this, going, holy Christ. Yeah, and it gets long, and I'm with Sonny. I'm used to my three to four and a half minute songs. No need to push this up that long, but the fans of Iron Maiden love this. I'm not one to criticize, because that's what they want. That's what they get. I, I love the sound. The vocals are great. Uh, the the move uh, I guess the song is based upon the 1968 movie which had Richard Burton and Clint Eastwood, and yeah, it is the History Channel. Tom, I agree with you there. There's a, <laughs> a running theme with that throughout this, but what a way to start an album! Yeah, and, and I'm I'm just real quick before we move on. I'm not going to try to convince you guys or anybody listening, you know, to to like Rush. My analogy was that. The people that love Rush. The people that you work with and handle, I probably will sue them too. The, 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 the technical music ability of the three of them, the lyrics, you know, Neil Peart wrote a lot of the lyrics, uh, very literary, literary themes, very thematic, you know, kind of like uh, Iron Maiden. Um, and a lot of it reminds me, I mean, obviously Iron Maiden is, more, is obviously much more metal than Rush. Rush is more of a rock, hard rock band. But listening to this album, I was like, there is a lot of... I'm hearing a lot of rush isms on this album, you know, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, particularly maybe with track two, but I will say reading about this album, they did talk about it, that they got into a little bit of progressive rock on yep. this album. Exactly. And Sonny, yep. you know, because you know, the history of the band a lot more than we do. Yep. Would you say that's something that, you know, that this album either picked up on or started or was it already always part of the band it was always a little bit there it had a little bit more punk flavor to it especially the first two albums steve harris by the way hates when people say that because he he's not a huge punk fan he's yep. all prog influence guy yep. so since he's doing most of the writing you know stuff like phantom of the opera and stuff like that off the first two albums is very very prog yep. but uh he tries to keep it metal there's no doubt about that. Nice. Gotcha. Well, let's go uh, to the next one. So, so one of the things you get from Maiden is part comic book, part intellect, part history channel, part metal, <clears throat> right? And uh, th this is a beautiful composition. I mean, it's partially a hymn that Bruce used to sing in school. 
It's partially about Aleister Crowley. It's partially Hindu philosophy. What? No Buddhism? Whatever. Um, (laughs) But uh, (laughs) this is exactly why, although it's a great song, it's a beautiful composition. I'll say that. This is exactly why I don't have an Iron Maiden uh, Desert Island album, because this is where they get a little too proggy for me. Like I, I need, I can hear and listen to Iron Maiden in four to five minute doses, but when there's a lot of time changes, they lose me a little bit. Love the intro. I can tell you normal people go to the opera or theater to get their culture. Rockers go to Maiden and Alice. I get it. And we're quite a bit away from, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) All right. You know, we're (laughs) way away from that. Um, But these guys, uh, this song is like at the outer edge of if I went to the next step, I would love Rush. This is this is where this song kind of lies for me. I was just going to say that I love this song, and it's one of the reasons why I love Rush. It's a long song, um, very proggy, has tons of transitions and time signature changes throughout it, just like Rush. That riff at the beginning when the song kicks in, that's Sweet Leaf by Black Sabbath. When the song kicks, when the song kicks into gear, that 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 is Sweet Leaf. And then in the middle of the song, when when the when the time change kicks in, that is Twenty One Twelve by Rush. It 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 sounds exactly like Rush. And this song is one of the reasons why I love Rush. <clears throat> and I, I'll be honest with you, I never knew that Iron Maiden had a song like this in their discography. Um, it's a great one. I'm, I'm a big fan of this. And it's, again, it's very rush like, and it's one of the reasons why I, I like rush. One of the things that I forgot to mention the previous song where he <clears throat> was there, it was written alone by Steve Harris. Don't know if I said that revelations. This one is written only by Bruce Dickinson. So there's different songwriters throughout this album. And I will make sure I try to remember to point that out. I like that. This is slow and then picks up. I like the changes in the song. So maybe if it wasn't for Getty Lee, I would like Rush Tom. I don't know. But I like this song. Um, and, and you're right, Sonny. Now you got the Bible. You got Alistair Crowley. Something named G.K. Chesterton's hymn he includes a line from it. Oh, God of Earth and All or something. I fucking can't even remember. Earth, right Earth and Altar. Yeah. And yeah. just... You know, it's it, obviously these people are educated. They're not saying about cold gin and you know and what else, Tom? What else? My they, heater's they, broke. They're not throwing. They're not throwing logs in people's fireplaces. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a little bit out of uh, our kiss range as far as the lyrics go. Yep, very good song. I, I like it, and it's it's interesting because I like the change of pace. Yep. So if you think about it, for me, this and maybe one other song sticks out as being a little bit different than Iron Maiden, but I uh, we'll get to that one. Uh, anything else before we move on to uh no nope. Flight of Icarus? Here we go. That last conversation reminded me. Ooh, it must be love. Wait a second. Fits like a glove. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Say it twice. Um anyway. <laughs> Fly to Icarus. Uh, so my son, who is about to graduate, he's a senior in college. Uh, he's taking a bunch of ancient history and you know all that kind of stuff. And uh, he was saying something about Icarus, and I'm like, "Oh, flight of Icarus. That's mythology." Blah, blah blah. He's like, "How do you know that?" And I'm like, "Because normal people get their history from books. I get them from Iron Maiden songs. Exactly. <laughs> yep. And my son <clears throat> loves Steve Harris. I'm like, "You need to go listen to Flight of Icarus, and you understand what I'm talking about." It's a sing-along chorus. Maiden doesn't have a ton of those. Um, vocal harmonies are pretty much all Bruce. The guitar solo switches between the two. That last note, that, that scream is mm. just, I mean, that's off the charts. There is absolutely zero wrong about this song. This is the perfect metal, new you know, new wave or British heavy metal song to me. Like if somebody says, put a metal uh, playlist together and and tell me, you know, give me songs between 81 and 85. This absolutely makes a list. There's no doubt. Okay, so Flight of Icarus, this is the reason that I ended up buying the, the Peace of Mind cassette in 83. Um, I like the song. Um, cool chorus, great solo. Um, to me, it sounds like a Dio song. Like, the, like that, like that kind of like that plodding kind of 
like somber kind of groove to it, it, it which isn't a bad thing because I love Dio. But the interesting thing that I notice about this song and when I'm listening to this entire album, people who listen to the our our, our show, I, I always say that I don't like fast kiss. I don't think I like slow Iron Maiden. I, I think I want to hear Iron Maiden do, you know, the trooper in, you know, run to the hills. I think that's their strength. It's a good song, but there's a reason why, you know, Steve Harris was not a huge fan of this song for that reason. Um, you know, they wrote it thinking that they would make their knock on, on American radio. And it did because it, it prompted me to buy the, to buy the album. But I, I prefer that up tempo like Zeus you know like that galloping fast Iron Maiden rhythm I think that's their strength uh, but that being said Flight of Icarus is definitely a good song all right written by Adrian Smith and Bruce Dickinson so guys enlighten me a little bit here uh, let me get go a little bit on this one so it is their first single first single in the U.S. and you're right Bruce Dickinson said he made it like that because he thought that that would help it in the U.S. and he says yeah and I was right and Steve Harris said that it was too slow for his liking that they should allow them to develop the song a little more and play it live and yep. figure out what the right speed of this is. And that's why he didn't like it. Um, so this is obviously based on Greek mythology. Um, if you guys know anything about mythology and stuff, this is based on the Minotaur and the Minotaur and he's in a labyrinth in Daedalus is the creator of this labyrinth and he helps um uh what's the name theseus get out and kill the minotaur and shows him out and they have to escape king minus Mm -hmm. this is at the palace of knossos which is the minoan civilization one of the earliest civilization world which still exists and is still there and it's in the island of crete the biggest island in greece my mom lives right in the capital i have seen this place probably seven times i've been to this place there is a chair and i think the chair like the the throne of a king the ancient ruins is there discovered by a british excavator and stuff archaeologist i don't know uh whatever and that chair that throne i think mini me could sit on that chair (laughs) so the development (laughs) of humans is fucking hilarious how small that chair was for a throne anyway so Daedalus, uh, they have to escape, so he takes his son Icarus, and he tells his son, there's two parts of this, everyone thinks of it, is the, the hubris part of it, says, don't go fly too high, and, because they made, he made like wings made out of like feathers and stuff, honey, whatever the fuck you put on him, because the sun will <clears throat> melt it. But he also said to him, don't go too low, don't <clears throat> start feeling a sense of security and easiness, and that because your wings will get wet and you'll drown. So he went up too high and he fell and he actually, you know, drowned in the ocean, which the ocean is named after Icarus, the Icarian uh, Sea. And that's how mythology is always like that. But anyway, so the funny thing is on this, Bruce changes the lyrics and makes it so like the father tricked him to tell him, you know, fly like an eagle, go up there. And what I find fascinating, because I didn't see this until, you know, you and this is why Iron Maiden is so like kiss like and cool. Their single has on the album cover basically Eddie walking away from Icarus falling down. He's got like a flamethrower with him. Yep. How fucking cool is that? Uh, and that's, that, that that's awesome. <clears throat> and Icarus looks like the Swan Song lo- logo from Led Zeppelin. Like, mm-hmm. oh, like falling down. I think that shit's brilliant. So you, when you talk about the stuff that you were saying earlier, Sonny, I'm like, holy fuck. Yeah, even a CD or cassette single, whatever, is, it's got like this whole backstory to it. Yep. Yeah, and like I said, did Derek have all that figured out and was he studious and he's some sort of historian, blah, blah, blah? I don't know that for sure. But I can tell you that you can get close enough to, okay, well, I at least know this part of the story and let somebody else finish the rest of it. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I will say, uh, and the video is kind of funny. You know, they have different clips. The band Mm. is doing a performance video. Then there's some, you know, mystic stuff and they're all dressed up. And uh, Martin Birch actually has a cameo in the video. The the song is great. I, I love it. Switching solos. I love that. The two of them go back and forth. It is a little bit slower, 
but the chorus is great. Bruce is insane, of course. Steve, I mean, like, I, I, again, I could just put what I said on where he goes there and just say the same thing throughout every one of these songs. But the one part I do want to say about Sonny is it, it gets a, you know, it gives you those goosebumps. That line in this song where he's repeating um, Icarus's words in the name of God, in the name of God, my father, I fly. When he screams that, holy shit, that is so fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I get it. You know, when Iron Maiden slows down a little bit, the opera gets very Shakespeare, <laughs> right? It feels like <clears throat> it Bruce does. Dixon should have a skull in his hand. It's a fly. You know, it's yeah, like, come yeah, on, dude, really? Exactly. But right? I think you calm down a little bit, calm down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that, but, but that, but that's exactly right. And I, I, I think when the, the slower the song, the slower his, his, his melodies, and it brings out that real operatic, even in the chorus of this song. Yeah. You know, um, but you know that being said, it's it, it's it's a good song. It's definitely a good song, and I love and I love the story and I love the story behind behind the lyrics and the title. So next one, uh, we're gonna get to "Die with Your Boobs Out." Don't- What's interesting to me is "Die with Your Boots On" is actually I think it's an American reference. I don't know why these guys from the UK are messing with this, but anyway, intro riff, love it. You know, the lyrics are about everything so doom and gloom. Just kind of go live life. Um, a little bit about Nostradamus. This whole, if you're going to die, if you're going to die, like, it's that's just bad. Like, uh, they need Mutt Lang here. Like, hey, bring in that Def Leppard dude. Let's uh, let's put some backing vocals on this thing. Um, and I'm sure, like, I was picturing, uh, you know, somebody like Stephen Piercy's in his basement going, okay, we can probably pull off the twin guitar thing. I can't do that voice. But we're not going to be singing about Dungeons and Dragons anyway. We're singing about pussy, so don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, it's true. <laughs> but uh, um, this song is because of the backing vocals. A little bit of a tough listen for me. All right, so here's a song that I'm a big fan. This, this is a standout song for me. I knew about this song even before, even before Peace of Mind. This is a song that I knew and I liked. Um, <clears throat> Bruce has a little bit of a growl at the at the beginning of the song. I, I like that this, the that operatic style that we keep talking about. It, it's it's in this song. It's definitely in this song. Um, it's got that great bass line, like we talked about before, that galloping sound. Uh, the pre-chorus that Sonny talked about. You know, if you're gonna die, very very punk rockish, and we talked about that before, especially when they were with Paul Diano. They were like a like a punk hard rock band. That to me sounded like that 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 gang vocals that you'd hear like in a punk song yay i don't mind it it's definitely not great and they could use some they could have used a little tweaks on it um this is a song that i would love to hear metallica cover just to see with the with the the you know the lyrics and the tone of the song you know i know metallica loves to do covers i don't think they've ever done anything by iron maiden if they have i've missed it um but i think this would have been a great one but th- this this is a, a standout track for me i just think it's uh like the idea of dying with your boots on, it's just badass. You know, I, I, it, it's, it's definitely a good song for me. I like it a lot. Zeus. All right. Done by, uh, written by Adrian Smith, Bruce Dickinson, Steve Harris. Uh, the thing that sticks out about this song is the chorus. Yep. Just repeating that chorus. Um, and it gives me, it, when it built up, if you're going to die, it built it up when he goes, and then you die with your boots on. It makes me think that it, it reminds me of, What's to come a little bit later, which is um, evil that men do. What does he call it? Right? Yep. The yeah. Evil well, that men do. Yeah. yeah. Like it builds up to that. The solos are incredible. I think I'm think Agent Smith does this one. I'm not sure, but you know, it's about dying with honor. And people have been. And Bruce Dickinson says people have been predicting the end of the century, the end of the world for centuries, and we're still here. So uh, another. You know, repeat what I said on Where Eagles There. Great all around. You name it, it's great. Another good song. And I do like the chorus on this. And this is the more catchy kind of song. So definitely. Yep. All All right. right. So I think we've heard of the next song. Trooper, based on 1854 Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, Basically, it's, it's a part of the Crimean war where British were told to attack, but there was a miscommunication basically walked into a Russian massacre. That's kind of how the story goes. 
He's a fool. He's a he's a he's a wartime hero fool. Uh, I like that the instruments kind of come in one at a time at the beginning of the song. Um, it's the guitar riff is one of my all time faves. Sing along chorus. It has no lyrics. If I can imagine Paul going, they got choruses with no lyrics. Then when am I <laughs> supposed to say sex? Um, or the galloping bass line, you know, just the great guitar harmonies. This is usually when Bruce is waving the Union Jack live. It's the most iconic Eddie. All that being said, the video, they're not handsome men. I don't know if I need Bruce with a, just a vest on and his hairy chest. I guess he's trying to do his best, Paul Stanley. Um, but, uh, you know, the rest of the video is super cool. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Again, basically a perfect metal song. I mean, it's just, it is very, very difficult to top this in 1983. Like, this is what people define as metal. And I love that the music stops and he gets to sing in the verse and the music stopped. Get, just, it's a great song. Yeah, Sonny, <clears throat> Sonny nailed it. The, even if you're not an Iron Maiden fan, th- this song is just, oh my God. What an epically spectacular metal song. It, it just everything about it is it's just what you want in a, in a metal song. That 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 riff, that gallop and bass line. He, he, Bruce sounds just amazing in this song. It I we've been listening to this song f- since it came out and I, I I still love it. If it shows up on satellite radio or if it shows up on my shuffle, it's just one of those songs that you just don't want to turn off. And if we're talking about intro lyrics to a song, you take my life, but I'll take yours too. You'll fire musket, but I'll run you through. It's just oh boy, that when that goes off, it's just and then it just continues, and you feel like just running through a wall. You know, like it, it, it get, the song gets you fired up, and the video is just awesome. You know, inter splicing you know the 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 the, the live performances with the uh, with the battle scenes. Um, I mean, what else can you say? The song is just amazing. The Trooper, written by Steve Harris. This is the quintessential galloping Iron Maiden song. I think oh, yeah. this is the quintessential, if you say the second wave of you know British invasion, this song would be the one you'd probably pick. This is the most iconic for me image in visually, um, you know, sound, you name it, Iron Maiden, the trooper. Um, I can't say enough about how incredible the song is. I've heard it a million times and I still never get sick of it. Yep. I don't even know where to begin. It was their second single. It went number 28 on the rock mains, um, mainstream charts. It's got that harmonized guitar riff, the Steve Harris, just that galloping in the drums and the vocals. I tried the other day. I was driving alone when I'm listening to this song on the highway. Try singing this song. Try it. Try <laughs> screaming along and singing this Half, not even halfway through the first verse or so, I can't do it. Like, I lost my breath. I can't. How the fuck does he perform this? This yeah. is insane, the vocals. And keep the words, the lyrics to this are off the charts. Off the charts. Read them all. Every single paragraph, when you read this, is like one's better than the next. Very bleak, dire about death and going into a certain death, but that's your duty and this is what you do. It's like you said, the Charge of the Light Brigade, which is the the Crimean War. So it was the British, the Ottomans, and France against Russia. They did the movie. The the movie is in the video of the 1936 Errol Flynn and mm-hmm. Olivia de Havilland movie. And funny thing is, Olivia de Havilland. I know this. I don't know why because it was something else. I was looking at a movie. I like the old classic black and white movies. She's still alive. Yeah. But look at that fucking footage in that in that song. Right? How ancient that looks. The actress in that is still alive. That is <laughs> fucked up. She's yep. like 104 <clears throat> years old or something like that. I just looked it up. That's insane that that woman is alive from that video. And I guess they got shit because people were like, look what you did to these horses and everything. And they're like, buddy, it was a fucking movie from the 30s. Go yell at them. It wasn't us. And, you know, it's just, he used to wave that Union Jack on this, right? And then he changed it because there was all this controversy when he was in the U.S. during the Iraq war. And him and Sharon Osbourne got into that. Bruce got into that big battle. 
I guess at Ozfest they were shitting on each other, and then fucking people were throwing eggs at them during this song, and they started throwing things. At yes, them? because of certain reasons. You know, I used to wear little shorts on the job and whatnot, and they would fire bricks and little pipes and bottles of beer at me and whatnot. And she was saying that waving the Ameri- the uh, British flag was unpatriotic, doing it in the U.S. during the Gulf. I'm like, no, it's not. She was just being a douchebag about it, and he was being a dick back. And apparently now he just wears the red coat instead. Yep. And he's got suits. He's got those silly suits. Yep. During this performance. It's just, I don't even know where to begin. It's uh, where to end. Well, it is uh-huh. one of probably the greatest metal songs i can ever think of his before we move on here's my one criticism and it's the video not the song what are those pants that bruce is wearing (laughs) dude you're you're an iron maiden you're in one of the most kick-ass metal bands and you're wearing it it looks like 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 the game of twister it's like what 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 you get the colored squares it looks like something a guy like britney fox should be wearing you're an iron maiden dude no they look like, yeah, like somebody, like a Karen in yeah. like California is wearing <laughs> on her right. way to her Zoom, Zumba class. Exactly. <laughs> that, I just, I don't know, it just made but me laugh. Let me add one more other thing. You're right, Sonny. He's not what you would call a handsome man. I am not what you would call a handsome man. The whole band. <laughs> The whole fucking band. I don't know. I think Adrian Smith and Steve Harris are the only normal looking one. Fucking the guitarist Dave Murray literally looks like the guy from Mad Magazine, but not with blonde hair. He looks like him. And then fucking somebody walk up and punch Nico McBrain in the fucking nose. Because That's- what the fuck? Or uh- someone took like an oar from a boat and just smashed his face in. Because he got a pancake face if I've ever seen one. Now, Bruce Dickinson. He's got those, I'm stereotyping. He's got those British Austin Powers teeth. Okay, I get it. I have bad teeth. Where, like, yep. he's singing and his, like, lips go in and his teeth come out. So his teeth are shown, like, he can't, like, display his mouth without his teeth coming out of his lips. And he's got it, those teeth. Just, he looks like he looks like he's wearing like those fake plastic teeth that you would stick up when you yeah. like do for a costume. <laughs> yeah, like like you would wear for an Austin Powers bride. Right? That's why you got to wear the rainbow pants to distract. <laughs> exactly. And that's why they stuck Nico McBrain behind the drums. I'm like, fuck, we can't yeah. have anybody looking at that guy's face. Yeah. Got, what? Three more drums. That, you got any more drums? Anybody got any more drums? And he's yeah. got that hairdo. That, like that fucking front hair. It just like looks like it's just plopped in the front and the long hair in the back. There was a girl in high school, I remember, so the kind of quiet girl for no reason, just the because we were assholes. We'd always go up to go, yeah, Bruce Dickinson. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> the girl would just walk by me like, oh. it just oh. had that Bruce Dickinson hairdo. And we would call her that. It's just what the fuck is wrong with us back then? But it's just. Just a fucking not a good looking band. No, they're not. They're not. No, no. They're like the, almost like the '86 Celtics of like metal bands. Oh yeah, we've talked about them before. They are a not a handsome, the, the most awkwardly gangly looking, <laughs> unattractive group of men. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't Robert's fault. It was all Kevin's fault. It was Kevin's Dude. fault. They looked like that. Kevin McHale looked like somebody hung Frank his body. <laughs> Kevin McHale looked like somebody hung his body on like a coat hanger. And then like, yeah, he, he had like his legs look like, you know, when you buy like those, those Halloween skeletons that have like the yeah, hinges yeah, and, the keys, yeah. and he just kind of dangles. <laughs> well, where are you going to go? Look at Bill Walton's face. What are you talking about? They also had. Fucking the only black man I've ever seen with freckles, DJ <laughs> Dennis Johnson. Look like somebody threw shit at him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Quint Buckner. Oh, holy fuck. Oh, God. <laughs> Where's the leader of this miscreant group, too? Larry Bird? <laughs> His fucking mustache. This little <laughs> blonde mustache, Larry Bird. Oh, he has to be. The most unattractive star athlete of all time. You you tell me who is an 
uglier star athlete than Larry Bird. He ugly. I ain't like the boy ugly. Oh, here we go. That'll be our poll question for <laughs> next week. <laughs> He's the most sunny <laughs> stinking. Robert Parrish wasn't a good looking man either. He was all right. He was all right. <laughs> He's like, he's looking around going, I'm the best out of this bunch right here. And oh, fucking Greg Kite was no picnic either. Oh, God. Very right. unattractive team. No. And, and, we, we, and that's the second time we've covered the 86 Celtics on Shout It Out Live cast. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, someone's going to go, have you fucking three seen your live cast? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Let's go over. Sober nowadays. But he was a huge drinker. And what's funny is the guy before him lost his job because he was drinking too much. And I was drinking. But I guess Nico can handle his drink a little bit better. But I guess one of the things he used to do is do impressions. And one of the impressions he would do is Edie Amin. I don't really know this person that much, but uh, he would make these weird voices. So on the tape that uh, it's backward masked, and I don't understand that whole backward shit. I guess it was big in the early 80s, but... You know, remember that fucking song was big in the 80s? You know, so they were already getting shit for being satanic, and he says, what ho said the ting with the three bones? Don't meddle with things you don't understand. Like, first of all, you gotta be halfway hammered to understand what the hell he's saying, but then they made it backwards, and they made it all crazy, so I don't know why that opens it. The song's based on a short story from 64 called The Inhabitant of the Lake. When you first hear it, you're like, "Uh uh-oh, here comes the ballad, right? Luckily, they work out of that about 90 seconds in. And that whole, that nightmare, you know, that he uses that a lot later on in Iron Maiden albums, too. That is the Dickinson go-to vocal melody. Like, you know, like Paul has that, whoa, 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 you know, that thing. Okay, so still life. So uh, Sonny was talking about the impression of Idi Amin, also known as the Butcher of Uganda, known as one of the most vicious despots, you know, in history. So that's a, the amount of history that we're giving our listeners on this. They're going to be like, wow, these guys may be really aren't as dumb as I thought. But no, we are. But that's OK. Um, still life. It's an interesting song. I, I like it. It's got a different vibe. Something, something a little bit different from Iron Maiden. Um, I like the chorus and and what Sonny said about that nightmares thing. This song kind of reminds me of something that Queensrÿche might do, um, especially that nightmares thing. A little bit, a little bit of a proggy song, and I know Queensrÿche, especially on Operation Mindcrime, very prog, like hard rock metal. Um, I like this song, and I, I, you know, I, I, I probably said it before, and I'll say it again. I, I never knew that Maiden had that prog e kind of feel to them maybe it's not on all their albums again i'm not i don't have the whole catalog but th- this is a great song and i and i like some of that proggy kind of queens reichish kind of feel to it it's a very good song still life written by dave murray steve harris i think that's dave murray's only credit on this album but influenced by ramsey campbell's 1964 short story the inhabitant of the lake so it's all about like something's in the pool of water or something and something's calling to him and then he's got to go to it and just, it's a story there. And, um, in, you know, it's, I don't know. It, it, it's the, the, uh, the lyrics are, are, are what they are. You know, he's got a background story. Again, it's not about, I want to go to the party and, uh, bring your beers and the hot chicks. None of that. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, Edie Amin, is very famous because supposedly you ate people too. Yep. Like guy was a cannibal. fucking monster. Yeah. And uh, there was a good movie that came out, The Last King of Scotland. Yes. And, Forrest uh, Whitaker. What's it? Forrest Whitaker. Forrest I thought Whitaker. he won an Oscar for that. Uh, I, th- I know he was nominated. Not sure if he won, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he uh, played Idi Amin, mm-hmm. uh, just a very bad person in history. I like the whole will give me peace of mind. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> which which goes back since you're not using still life as one of the parts in the song that those words, why didn't you call this peace of mind after the album? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I you don't know. know. It's just I, one I, of those things Iron, anyways. Iron Iron Maiden seems to do a lot of what Led Zeppelin does where they don't say the name of the title in the song. You know, Zeppelin's you know. fame 
like in the grunge people do that nirvana and stuff, yeah though, yeah they never the they never yeah. say like the, the title but yeah go ahead go ahead Zeus, sorry you know and it's just the usual suspects great drums great vocals great lyrics great solos great guitar and the bass of course same old stuff it's fantastic good song all right let's <laughs> Let's go to the next one. We go from the History Channel to the National Geographic Channel slash Nick at Night Flintstones theme song. I, I, <laughs> these lyrics are so cheesy. Like Bruce is trying to hit these crazy notes just to kind of distract you from the craziness of this song. And even Bruce has called it cheesy. He said that Steve Harris kind of was needling him that there was no way he could hit the vocal melodies that Steve wanted him to hit, and he wanted to prove them different. So he went out there and did all this shit. He didn't actually think this song was going to make the record. <laughs> now, all the things Zeus has said before, the drums, the musicianship, all that is great, but uh, I can't get past the dinosaurs. So the best thing about this song is it's not eight and a half minutes long. That's about the best thing about this song. When we decided that we were going to do Peace of Mind, I, again, I'm not familiar with this with, with a lot of this album. So I put it on and I go, I go for my, my, my run and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go for a nice long run. I'm going to listen to Peace of Mind. I swear to God, I am not exaggerating this for entertainment purposes. I literally laughed out loud when I hear, at a time when dinosaurs walk the earth, I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is happening right now? What am I, li like, I literally, I'm like, there's no way a band really wrote that and put it on a fucking metal album. This is one of the worst songs in the history of metal. It is so painfully horrible. And, and Sonny, you said, Bruce Dickinson's vocals are all over the place it is it's just so bad it's comical it's it, this should be this should be a lesson on what not to do it's just so bad i don't know where to go with it that's all i can say it's just horrible and it's hysterically bad it's so bad zeus go ahead quest for fire written by steve harris it's about the 1981 movie i remember this because 1981 movie quest of fire because when i first got cable on hbo it was always playing you know, the voice when he does that and we're home. Like, I was like, whoa, what the fuck is that? And the lyrics, I almost feel like this is a parody. Me too. This is what we feared that me and Tom feared about like doing fucking sabotage, Dio, fucking Iron Maiden, like Dungeons and Dragons rock. Like this stupidity shit. Yep. And when. It's just, you know, it's a good song. I think the music and everything else is still good, so it saves it. But when dinosaurs walk the earth, I'm waiting for him to go. And I, I'd rather hear this. Open the door, get on the floor, everybody walk the dinosaur. That's a great song. <laughs> Was not. I would rather hear that. <sighs> um, Fucking. But this is a great dance, dude. I love that song. Oh. Absolutely love it as well, Sonny. Now, there's a reason I said it too. <laughs> Insert clip. Um, so I just, you know, it's just when dinosaurs right. Oh. <laughs> just <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Let's go next. So normal people get poetry from Edgar Allan Poe, Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost. Let's say I go to Maiden. That's how I get my poetry. Um, so this thing is from an essay, the Sun and Steel. And uh, Mushashi is known for the whole samurai sword fighting with two swords at a time, Ronin. Uh, believe it or not, he killed his, he had his first kill with a stick. Um, <laughs> whatever. Okay. The song is great, though. Like, it's got a sing-along chorus. It's got the gallop. I think it's super underrated because of Icarus and Trooper. And it could have been a single and done really, really well. So in the Maiden groups, or if you are a, a hardcore Maiden fan, <clears throat> this is a song people used to go usually go to on this record and say, you got to hear this. You only know Trooper and Icarus. You got to listen to this. The only criticism I have with it, and I wish uh, that they would have changed this, is Dave Murray does a solo, and he does okay. 
But if I have my choice between Murray and Smith, I like Smith better. And I think Adrian Smith would have ripped on the solo a little bit more. Dave is the original guy, but uh, I think Adrian would have done better. But this is a great song. Yeah, Sonny, spectacular song. And I'm glad you said what you just said. You know, in, in the Iron Maiden circles, people regard this. You know, it's probably the way like Kiss fans talk about like Mr. Speed, like, oh, you know, you know, you know, I want you and Colin Dr. Love. But when you get rock and roll over, you got to put on Mr. Speed. I don't know how this. Song, I've, I, li- I swear to God, I've never I've never heard this song before in my life ever. And it's amazing. It's an amazing song. I it's it's exactly what I want from Iron Maiden. And when you talked about um, Musashi with the. Um, What's your name? My name is John. John what? John Musacha. Is yes, that's right, sir. Yes, okay. With with the you know with the with the samurai and everything, it, it's it's amazing how much I'm learning that the, Steve Harris is in his lyrical inspiration. It's like Neil Peart from Rush. It, it's the same. Like when you listen to Rush albums, it's all of this really deep literary themes, and it's it, it's just amazing and. I just think this is such a standout song, and I found myself like going to this a lot. You know, kind of preparing for this uh, for this episode. I, I, it's a really, really great song. Written by Bruce Dickinson and Adrian Smith, the galloping sound. This is probably the great, the best chorus on this album. Yep, I can sing this. So, what I tend to do is I try to listen to them through. Then I'll play the album in the background when I'm doing chores or doing things. When this would come on, I would I would gravitate to this song. Yep. So usually, and me and Tom had this thing when we started with this album. We were both like, we just did Trouble Walking. We're doing this. We're like, oh. And we're like trying to say save it, but we're like, oh. Like, I got to fucking listen to Peace of Mind and Trouble. <laughs> like songs I'm not really that familiar with. And oh, this is just not. This song, thank God. You know, um, it, the band grows on you. The music grows on you. But this one didn't, it, it came instantaneous. Mm-hmm. And that's not something I would say about all, this whole album. It took a lot of listening to picking out songs and differentiating them because a lot of them, if you just play this through, I think the trooper would stick out and this would, for me at least. But the other songs, they all can kind of, they're all great. But it just kind of blends. I can't tell which is which until you hear them again. This I could tell the difference from. I heard it instantaneously. And, you know, like you said, the title is based on a samurai, Miyagi, whatever the fuck his name is. <laughs> I don't know. Some 1960s. You look I. You always look I. JC Penny, canvas. Hey, what kind of belt do you have? Canvas. You like? <laughs> J.C. Penny, 398. <laughs> Show me Santa Flora. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so I, I, I am a huge fan of this song. Great surprise finding this. And um, I do want to make a point to say, because we're almost to the last song. I reached out to our good friend, um, Steve Wright, who's a huge Iron Maiden fan, right? Mm-hmm. No pun intended. And I asked him about this. I, d- I didn't say we were doing this as an album. Did mm-hmm. you just call him fat? Wait a second. <laughs> I'm still trying fat? to get the no pun intended. I don't Who's know. He said, he's huge no, he Iron said no, he said right. He said he's a huge <laughs> Iron Maiden fan, right? <laughs> what did I call him fat? What Sonny, <laughs> Sonny, Sonny, <laughs> Sonny thinks everybody's fat. <laughs> Good afternoon, Paradise. Hi, is uh, the fat muffin man there? Excuse me? Yes, Fat Muffin Man is he in? Fat Muffin Man? Yeah. Well, hopefully that's not me. I'm the biggest one here. What? <laughs> he said he's a huge now Iron Maiden I'm wondering fan. if I said it. You, know, you, <laughs> you said he's a huge Iron Maiden fan, right? And you said no pun intended because his last name is right. And Sonny, yeah. thought, you meant, Sonny thought you meant you were calling Steve huge. <laughs> like he's a huge Iron Maiden fan. Dude, I, I'm like sitting there listening to him laugh. I'm like, did you just call him fat? I'm like, no, I ain't calling fat. What the fuck are you talking about? Oh, fuck. Oh, go ahead, Zeus. Go ahead. Fucking, fucking die over there. Who the fuck is Sonny Pooney? Jesus. 
fucking get Jericho. Yeah, exactly. Bitch slap you. Jesus Christ. And Sonny Cooney, <laughs> what a piece of shit that guy is. <laughs> you got me all fucked up now. Go anyway. Ahead. What I was saying is I asked Steve, I reached out to him. What are your thoughts on peace of mind? I just got it thinking about what do you think? What track should I look for? Didn't mention this at all. So I'm disappointed. Really? Uh, No, no. He went, he went to the, you know, flight of Icarus and shit like that. Eagles there and stuff. But I found it interesting that this thing, you know, you're right. I love that. You're telling me that people, this is a really endearing deep cut. That's great. Yep. So let's finish this up. Last song. Came a land. It was supposed to be named Dune, right? Because uh, that's where it was inspired from. <laughs> but check this out. Frank Herbert <laughs> wrote this novel. <laughs> they went to him and he says, I hate rock bands. I especially hate hard rock bands. And basically told him to fuck off. <laughs> um, uh, my problem with this song is the lyrics need a diet. Like, if I needed the whole story, you might as well have wrapped them to me. So the vocal melody completely loses me. And it's supposed to have this epic song feel, but it just doesn't work for me. So, if like, if this was the concert closer, I'd be eight minutes closer to home compared to everybody else. Like, that's, that's kind of my take on this song. So the Rush fan in me likes this. It's long, but it's okay. I, I, it's you know it's not it's not a standout track on it. It is too long, but that's probably the reason why it's the last song on the album. It, it's a good it's a good song. You know, not my favorite, not a go to on the album, but I like that. I like its epic feel, and I like that the album is not loaded with those epic songs. But yeah, it, it's it's a good song. But again, you know, there's a reason why some bands put songs at the end of the album, and that might be the reason for this one. Yeah, I think of this as an another epic, but it's not. <clears throat> outlaw torn way to end us an album mm-hmm. right or right. like no, suicide way to end an album yep i, I just I, I again you think quest for fire was bad <laughs> this is the ultimate dungeons and dragons song but oh yeah the 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 hubris of them let me write a theme about a movie or a book and I'm going to do it, and, uh, and, and I'm going to play it out there. It's like, I don't know, if Kiss says, um, I'm going to write a song, and it's going to be called Goodfellas. Yeah, there was a bunch of Goodfellas, and, and, and then the fucking writer in Martin Scorsese is like, I don't want to use this shit. I don't like your fucking music. Get the fuck out of here. Like, what gave them the idea to write this stuff about, like, give, like, the plot and all this stuff about, like, without asking them? It's not going to go into the movie or something. So, like, where the fuck did you write it? Like, I don't blame them. It's like like me doing a bunch of shit for you, Tom. And you're like, I don't even know you, buddy. Get the fuck out of my house. Yes. Yeah. It just seems, like, so strange. And, just, like, reading the lyrics in, like, these words of places and people and characters. And, like, this is so Dungeons and Dra- Dragons rock. At least the other one's about cavemen and dinosaurs. <laughs> Just, That's not enough great. No, oh, and this is like fucking, I don't know what, 18 minute long song? I don't know what the fuck how long this is. It's just, ah, uh, it didn't work at all. Not at all. No, and I so, think, I think and it was liked, written by Steve Harris, so I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I think you're right. Like taking a song and writing a, writing a song about a movie it's or, or like based yeah. on it, it it's just does it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense it's it's yeah, but like without permission or without right. like thinking right. this through right yeah, i mean it's just i don't know yeah it's a dud it, i mean it's it it uh, musically i can tolerate some of it it's seven and a half minutes long so it goes on a little too long musically i like it but lyrically as just with some of the songs on this album it's like all right enough Set, settle down <laughs> There's an overall feeling of settle down on this whole fucking album. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I find myself being like, look, you all need to settle down on this album. <laughs> well, that's um, peace of mind. Those are the tracks. Anything else you guys want to add before we start ranking the songs? Yeah, I want to say that when we when Sonny first picked this album... Um, and I made I made a, a a general comment to Zeus, but we try to save it. And that was pretty much Zeus got the vibe because I think he said the same thing. It was like, oh boy, how like how how am I going to get through this? Like a first first listen, I was like, Ugh. but I'll tell you right now, 
this album kind of pulled like the Stockholm syndrome with me after the last few weeks. I'm a fucking fan. And I know I thank Sonny for that. And I'm glad that I gave it a chance and I, that I kind of listened to it and paid attention musically and lyrically. Um, I found myself like at first I was like, okay, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to put on peace of mind. And I was like, okay, okay. And then, and then, you know, even leading up to this week, I was like, I was listening to it. Like I wanted to listen to the album. Um, and I think that's a great thing about music. Uh, you know, when people talked about that, when we did our episode on load, people like, Oh, you, you did an episode on load. I'm going to listen to the album. People like, Oh, it's not a bad album. I think that's the great thing about music is your mind is telling you, Oh yeah, that's not a good album or, Oh, Iron Maiden that you, that you don't like Iron Maiden. But then this comes along and I'm like, I'm a, I'm a fan of this album. Maybe not the entire album, but I enjoy a lot of this. And I think that surprised me from where I was at the very beginning when you picked this album to where I am today. So um, I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah. I think the interesting piece is, and I, you know, I'm speaking for myself here. Would I have given it a chance if it wasn't for Eddie? If the album cover had five ugly dudes on it <laughs> and it started with Tame a Land and Quest for Fire, what do I just give up and walk away? <laughs> Right. You know, I, maybe, right? And I, Paul's right. You do listen with your eyes. I, that's how it is, right? It's that's true. what kind of brings you in. And there was a lot of bands in the 80s that I didn't listen to because my eyes were telling me these guys, they're not good, right? So uh, there's a piece of it. But once you get the chance and you hear a song like Sun and Steel, like that won't leave your playlist now, which is awesome, right? Yep. Like the Trooper and Icarus has been with us our whole adult lives sun and steel you're catching in mid 40s early 50s that's pretty cool Dude, yep. speak for yourself with this early 50s shit <laughs> so <laughs> um i i don't want to give away too much but uh, again i'm happy you picked this i'm happy that we we got into stuff that we didn't just hit into our safe zone just hair metal bands that we all are popular and pick an album that's a little bit different and not in my normal playlist. So I'm happy you took load. I'm happy that you took this, Sonny. And uh, I'm better for it. It will be on my playlist. So I will get into it more when we go through the tracks and start ranking them compared to everything else. But let's go to the album tracks. Always our favorite. Sonny, you uh, have your uh, math brain working to be able to rate these eventually for the top three. So let's go this time, Tom, Sonny, me. I think we did the opposite last time. All right. My number nine, Quest for Fire, the theme from Jurassic Park. (laughs) (laughs) My number nine, To Tame a Land, the song for every dust storm ever made. (laughs) Sonny Pooney. I am with you, number nine, to tame a land. Wow. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, that is my number eight. To tame a land is my number eight. My number eight is the Flintstones theme, Quest for Fire. <laughs> <laughs> my number eight is as well, Quest for Fire, Sonny. Okay. Uh oh, this is getting scary already. I'm anxious to see my list is going to be all over the place probably, but <clears throat> my number seven is where Eagles dare. My number seven is if you want to die, if you want to die, if you want to die, <laughs> like that backing vocal is pretty brutal. Okay. My number seven is where Eagles dare. Ooh. Ooh. All right. This is where I might get some hate, but I don't care. Number six flight of Icarus. Wow. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. I, t- I, I, I don't like the slow Iron Man. It's a good song. It's a good song, but there's songs I prefer more than that on this. Wow. All right. My six is Where Eagle- Eagles Dare. Six for me, Revelations. And that is my number five. Revelations is five for me. Number five for me is Revelations. Five, Still Life. That's my number four. Still life. That's my number four. Still Whoa. life. Interesting. Die with your boots on. 
this is weird because that's my number three. Die with your boots on. This is the most already. I can't believe by it's... far the closest we've ever had. Amazing, yeah. So we're at number three. Yep. I'm at Sun and Steel. Sun and Steel is uh, I, the, my top three. Were very very tough to choose from. Okay. So I went with three because of the guitar solo. Wish Adrian would have done it. Okay. Three for me was Flight of Icarus. My number two is Sun and Steel. Awesome song. My number two is Icarus. That is an awesome song. The only reason I chose two is because of uh, the iconic Eddie for my number one. Sun and Steel for me, number two. And I'm pretty sure we're all going to have the same number one, The Trooper. Yep. Yep. Wow. That's amazing. This is insane. You know what's amazing? Because we, me and Tom have done this a few times now. We're albums we've never talked about, something that was new, like Load, and we had the best song the same. We, you know, Obviously, The Trooper is kind of well-known, but this album is new to me, and I think this is, album is technically new to you too, Tom, really. Yeah, yeah, you haven't really listened to it. And look yep. how similar we, we gravitated because I, w- I, I think a lot of these songs are very similar sounding. Some of them and, are, yeah. And the thing that I wanted to add, though, Sonny, is you are absolutely correct. What a difference this would make if they started this song, this album with Quest for Fire and To Tame a Land. Oh, God. I'd be like, dude, I don't even want to listen to the rest of this. Yeah. Because then it's not like they're not bad songs. Even To Tame a Land, it's not a bad song, but it feels like it's work. <laughs> yeah oh right. no you're right like oh Agreed. god i'm gonna have to listen and quest for i'm like oh god is everything gonna be about like yep. you know the the princess and the queen and the king comes around <laughs> with a sword <laughs> like nerd, nerd! <laughs> settle <laughs> settle down bruce That's like, yeah. <laughs> relax dude go over there take deal with you and yeah. go fucking play an imaginary chess set and with your wizard hat on yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> So our top three, number one was Trooper. Doesn't make uh, that doesn't surprise anybody. Two was actually Sun and Steel, and nice. three collectively was Flight of Icarus, and a close fourth was Still Life, which was in my all of those were my top four anyway. Cool. Yeah. All right. This was awesome. How the rankings turned out. That was good. So this will be very interesting coming up. Okay. Yep. So album cover rankings. The albums that we reviewed so far. We reviewed Appetite for Destruction, Slide It In, OU812, Super Unknown, Pyromania, Load, and uh, Peace of Mind. Who wants to go first? And I'll read you your old order. I'll go first. All right. So, Tom, you're first. Um, You did Appetite for Destruction, Pyromania, Slide It In, Super Unknown, Load, OU812. So we're talking album covers. Album covers. All right. Well, we have a new champion. Peace of mind goes to number one for me. Wow. As as a fan of, you know, horror movies and just scary, creepy shit in general and just Eddie. I mean, I love the I love the Appetite album. I love the the Pyromania album. But this this album cover is just amazing. So definite number one for me right now. Sonny, you had. Slide it in. Pyromania. Appetite for Destruction. Super Unknown. OU812. Load. Very tough for me because I love boobies. Is this some kind of bust? Well, it's very impressive, yes, but we need to ask you a few questions. And snakes <laughs> in boobies? Um, <laughs> why can't Bruce think about that? Boobies! Like, why can't he do that? Uh, but anyway... Um, this is going to be number one for me too. Eddie is iconic. Yep. Eddie has been in my life since 1986 and, um, Eddie's the man. Wow. So I think I am the only one I'm going to stick with appetite for destruction. Okay. I think this is incredible. My, my title, my covers, excuse me. My order was appetite for destruction, slide it in pyromania, super unknown. OU eight, one, two load. I'm going to slide this one in above slide it in and underneath appetite for destruction. This is number two appetite right. destruction is just so iconic for me. And it's also more of a sentimental pick for me as well. 
Yep. Uh, and I also think, and the other thing holding this back, as great and incredible as Peace of Mind is, I think he, they have better album covers. <laughs> and that's they pro- incredible oh, no. about yeah. Iron Maiden. And so I it's not right. their best. So right. like, I, if, if it was their best, I would put that probably ahead of Appetite. But this one is still incredible. You know, yeah, and I'm going to probably insane. go with this. Yeah. And Sonny, what are you holding up? Final Frontier. Like, I just picked an album. I have all of them right here. I just randomly yep. picked one. It's just anything you pick is just incredible. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. It's amazing. Yeah. The, pro- probably the only band I can think of that can consistently challenge Kiss for just album cover, uh, you know, consistently. You know what, what? I mean? You think that album cover is better than The Elder? <laughs> better than Animalize? What's yes. wrong with you? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Better than Asylum? Oof. Better than anything after Love Gun, pretty much. Yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> now we're going to do album ranking. Tom, you're going to go first. So here's what you ranked your albums. Pyromania, Appetite for Destruction, Super Unknown, Load, Slide It In, OU812. I like this album. I do. But unfortunately, it is now going to be the new cellar dweller for my rankings. It will be it will be last. Okay. And 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 that and that is and and when you look at the albums that we've done, I think even being last is good when you're looking at these albums. You were the last winner. I just like Van Halen more than I like Iron Maiden. So I, I don't think there'll ever be an Iron Maiden album that I'm going to rank ahead of Van Halen, let alone the rest of those albums on that list. So I like it, but it's going to be last. Sonny, you had Slide It In, Appetite for Destruction, Pyromania, OU812, Super Unknown, and Load. Where do you put peace of mind? Well, that list has two Desert Island albums for me. And... I struggled with the Pyromania piece, so this one's going to go dead center for me. So it's going to go slide it in, Appetite, Pyromania, Peace of Mind, right before OUA 1-2. Wow. Wow. All right. For me, I had Pyromania, Appetite for Destruction, Super Unknown, Slide It In, Load, OU812. I am not sure, but... These albums, both Load and Peace of Mind, are both new to me. And I love them both. But because this is nine songs compared to 14, <clears throat> and the number one reason is because it has the probably one of the top five songs on the all these albums combined, The Trooper, I'm putting it ahead of Load. So I'm going Pyromania, Appetite, Super Unknown, Slide It In, Peace of Mind, Load, OU812. Wow, you still got OU812 in the cellar. Oof. Yeah. Okay. That's where I have these ones ranked. Um, that's, our, uh, that's our coverage of Peace of Mind. Great pick, Sonny. Absolutely. Uh, I am better for having this song this album, excuse me, in my catalog and for putting it on my rotation. So excellent pick, Sonny Pooney. Agreed. Definitely a good one. Yeah, good album. And I, I will tell you that hardcore metalheads, um, there's many believe that Number of the Beast, Peace of Mind, Power Slave is a trilogy that can be that can rival some of the trilogies out there that exist. Oh yeah, I agree with I, I agree with that. Yep, yeah that that's that's a trifecta there for the ages for sure. Those albums definitely. <clears throat> okay. Yep. So next we do this order of the tracks. So Tom, what makes you rock hard today? All right, I'm gonna go with a uh, with a with a with a, a, a curveball here. So everybody knows my love of uh, horror, sci-fi, thriller, all that stuff. So there's a there's a show. That just came out last month on Netflix. And the show is called Betal. B-E-T-A-A-L. It's not Bilal. <laughs> Bilal. <laughs> it's Betal. Okay. It's an Indian series. So it's dubbed. It's dubbed in English. Um, it's only four episodes long. Okay. 
and it's an interesting it's an interesting plot if you're into horror thriller zombie stuff. So what it is, it's it, it's it's a it's this group of um, Indian military people that are hired to build a road. And in order to do that, they need to displace this ancient like tribal village. And there's a tunnel that they need to kind of get move and get rid of and do their thing. And inside the tunnel is a the cursed remnants of um, a bunch of uh, redcoats from the Indian Rebellion of 1857. And they're all cursed like zombies. It's amazing. The special effects are awesome. The gore effects um it's creepy it's it's very very interesting it's not a bit not a big commitment because it's only four episodes but i highly recommend it if you like to be freaked out and you like to see something different it's called betal b-e-t-a-a-l very cool series on netflix i i check it out i enjoy especially the first episode is killer it's not about the little israeli boy that we adopted at flynn basement at stonehill college who's come back to haunt us and terrorize us from Stone no, Hill College? There isn't, but there is a character in this who looks like he could be Belal as an adult. Okay. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very cool. Funny. So for my pick uh, this week, we, Nicole and I sometimes do ka- kamikaze movie watching. So we'll go on Netflix or Amazon Prime and find something that we've never seen and just give it a shot. And at times we walk away in 20 minutes and at times it's so bad. You have to see it all the way through. And at times we actually get into it. So we checked out this movie on Amazon prime released in 2013 called assault on wall street. Have you ever seen this movie? No, it's got a bunch of no names. Uh, Michael Paré, Eric Roberts are probably the only two people you would even recognize. And they're like co-stars. The main star is Dominic Purcell. And, uh, he's in this, uh, there's a TV show called Legends of Tomorrow, and he's kind of like a bad and like an anti-hero in that. Mm-hmm. The timeline on this thing is in 2008 financial crisis. He's a security guard, ex-military. Wife gets sick. They lose all their money in the stock crash. He loses his job. They lose a house. Wife commits suicide, and then he decides to play pseudo punisher and take care of all the people that made him lose his money, and he just starts blowing away. Like John Wick style, perfect Wall Street guys. Nice. Right? And I'm watching this thing, and in about a, it's about 90 minutes, about about an hour in. I'm like, oh my god, Do- Dominic would make a great Punisher. I don't know if he oh, ever yeah. tried out for any of the movies, but he's got the facial expression, um, and he's got the physique, and he would make a great Punisher. But it, it was a, it's a B movie. There's no doubt. This was straight to fucking VCR VHS shit. Uh, but uh, it's pretty good for guys who kind of like Punisher style movies. Well, I'll tell you, Dominic Purcell. If you ever watched Prison Break, the oh, TV I've show. Never, oh yeah, right. I've never seen that. Oh my god, one of the greatest TV series ever when it first came out. They tried to bring it back recently, but when it originally came out in the early two thousands, Dominic Purcell was the star of the show, and he he's a good like badass kind of character. So just for him alone, I, I would check it out because I have Amazon Prime too, but I've never heard of it, but. Cool recommendation. Zeus, what do you got, buddy? Um, so for me, I I am a huge history buff. Uh, that was my major. I I love everything nonfiction histo- history. And the History Channel last week, uh, I think it was the week before, I'm not sure, had a three-part documentary on Grant, Ulysses S. Grant. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And I am uh, always been kind of a fan of his and watching the documentary. So it's sometimes it's reenacted footage. They have actors playing him throughout and then they'll go. They, they'll start questioning historians about his whole life and stuff. Absolutely fascinating. I fucking love it. And what's great is they talk about it towards the end is what kind of a shit like uh, change of history that has changed people's perception of Grant. Like when he died, there was Abe Lincoln, George Washington, and Ulysses S. Grant. They were the three heroes. And so the then they talk about history in the South, which has a lot to do with what's going on now, try to rehabilitate the South. 
and the lost cause and the forgotten, all that, all the stuff and change the whole. Yeah, we fought for slavery, too. No, no, no. It was for states rights. And all of a sudden now, you know, Grant in, in the hero that he was turned out to be the northern aggressor, the butcher, the ones that him and Sherman came down and destroyed the south. And and it changed everything. And, uh, and then everything. Grant was the drunk and he had the most corrupt presidency. He himself was a very moral man. The wars that he fought, the battle that he was in, insane. And I didn't realize, because everyone's always like, oh, Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee was a genius and stuff. But Grant never gets the recognition of changing things. And the fact that, (laughs) and they go into details, the strategy he used, yeah, he had more numbers, but nobody else was getting the job done. And if he didn't get the job done and help win those battles, Abe Lincoln was going to lose the election of 1864 because there was a at, during that time, the Democrats that were running for president of the United States. There were Democrats then, even though most Democrats left with the South. Those people wanted a truce with the South. That candidate wanted a truce and end the war and you take yours, we'll take ours and let's stop this because it was going on so much. And whoever he had in charge before weren't winning any of the battles. And because of Grant, he gave Lincoln that that you know that push that hey, we are gonna win this. Let's just stick through this. If Lincoln had lost, we would have lost the South. It would have been gone. And it was Grant that did a lot of it. Fascinating stuff, great history, great lessons to be learned. And uh and it's a shame that his presidency in the man is not as revered as he should be. Take a listen, take a watch it, you'll love it. Who the hell needs school? All you got to do is listen to this episode. You're getting all the history you want in your whole life between Maiden and Zeus. I was just going to I was just going to say between, you know, this is the most unbelievable episode we've ever done. And Zeus, I want to ask, it was on the History Channel. Was this before or after all the Iron Maiden? Because Iron Maiden is the History Channel metal (laughs) band. So they squeezed in an episode on Grant. I mean, that's amazing. But no, all all, all jokes aside, I, I, I love that American history. And it's funny because I was talking to my son. He's going to be a junior in high school in the fall, and um, he's he's going to be taking U.S. history, and he's excited to learn about you know that, and then you know getting into the world wars and everything, um, and that stuff is fascinating. So that that would definitely be something I would check out for sure. Well, check it out because they did one the previous year on Washington that I watched. Yep, three like a three part documentary, two hours, half reenactment in an actor, and then half documentary. They did the same thing on Grant awesome you will learn so much and it's fascinating stuff and it's funny r- real quick before we wrap it up zeus when, we, when m- my son and i were talking about history uh, you came up in the conversation i go oh i go michael i go uh you know zeus majored in in history and in, in when we were in college together he's like oh good i can use him for uh, a reference if i needed to do anything i go are you kidding me i'm like you won't get zeus to stop talking about history <laughs> If you bring up a if you bring up a topic on that, so I, I said it was it was it was funny though because my my son he he's he's so into that as well. So just uh, just cool stuff, and uh, that's definitely something to check out, or at least that I'll a check nice out. running theme, Tom. Huh? With Iron Maiding and this, <laughs> exactly. and dinosaurs and Dungeons and Dragons and wizardry and it's it's the most learned episode of Shout It Out <laughs> Loudcast you're <laughs> and ever gonna get. <laughs> he's dying. Um, all right, Sonny, where can we find you, buddy? Uh, GrownUpRock.com. Uh, we've been around. We're about to have our fourth anniversary coming up here real soon. Wow. And uh, Podcast Rock City, Kiss Podcast, been around seven years. So pretty cool awesome. podcast. What have you got out recently? Uh, with Which one? Uh, Grown Up Rock or Podcast Rock City? One. Oh, uh, Grown Up Rock, uh, we just did a, well, we did the interview with Eric Martin, Britt Lightning. We talked Foreigner, which was fun. Um, there's a couple of episodes coming up that'll be pretty good. Uh, with Podcast Rock City, we've been doing like a lot of top 10, top five things. We're going to, uh, we just did, <laughs> we, we uh, remixed and reordered Hot in the Shade. That was very interesting. Um, oh, yep. You know, there's plenty of Kiss stuff you can talk about. There's no doubt about that. Kiss, what the fuck is that? Kiss. No one listens to Kiss. Listen Emerson, to Lake Emerson, and, Lincoln, Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer. Palmer. There oh. you go, buddy. <laughs> brutal. Um, go ahead, buddy. Where can people find us? 
So we're on all the social medias, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can reach us online at uh, our email, excuse me, shout it out loudcast at gmail.com. We're an all kiss podcast. If you're f- discovering this episode for the first time, these are our bonus episodes. We do favorite albums of non kiss material, but um, check us out. We're available wherever you can hear a podcast and we're part of the spectacular Pantheon podcast group. And, uh, another member of Pantheon who's been on a guest on our show, Mr. Martin Popoff. If you're a fan of Iron Maiden, he has a ton of Iron Maiden books. Um, so check that out. Check out his show and check out his books as well. Yeah. Don't forget, we like to always pimp out Click T Shop, uh, Ed Spangenberg, who does uh, all the Shout It Out Loud cast merch. Click K L I C K T E E S H O P dot com. Click T Shop. You get your Shout Out Loudcast merch and other uh, artists, uh, podcasts uh, do their shirts over there. And uh, do you guys do yours with him as well? Uh, no, we, we don't. Uh, I don't think we've ever talked think, about it. I thought PRC started yeah, recently. PRC yeah. did. PRC yeah, does, yeah. 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 Growing yeah. up, okay. doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they all, and obviously, Ed has those fantastic shirts. Kiss theme shirts. We all have a bunch from him. Check yep. them out, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's where you can find us. But of, of course, what we like to get is those are those emails. We obviously you know we read them on the air, and you can reach us at shoutitoutloudcast at gmail dot com. Shoutitoutloudcast at gmail dot com, and also on Podchaser. Please give us a rate. Rate us. Give us those five star child. Reviews on Podchaser and iTunes. They help other people find us and it promotes the actual podcast. So we greatly appreciate that. Before we go, we always end with some last uh, famous last words. Tom, want to go first? Bavarian Alps that lay (laughs) all around. They seem to stare from below. The enemy lines a long time past are lying deep in the snow. I'll say it again. <laughs> Settle down, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> right now, there's some 39-year-old living in their basement. Mom, I just found this new history podcast. I just listened <laughs> to the first episode. These guys are so <laughs> smart. They're talking about Indian horror and Ulysses S. Grant and all these <laughs> other amazing things about dinosaurs and Dune and, and samurai <laughs> Japanese guys. <laughs> go ahead Uh, okay Uh, let me get to my poet voice now it's clear and I know what I have to do I must take you down there to look at them too hand in hand then we'll jump right into the pool can't you see not just me they want you too they do. Oh, God. <laughs> you do. You know what the problem is? I think I think these guys need to get laid. I think that's the problem. They just, just put the fucking books down and go 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 get drunk and laid. Go go hang out with Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I should have ended that with nightmares. Yeah, exactly. Nightmares. <laughs> oh, God. oh man, I'm gonna end with the best chorus. Of this whole album, sunlight falling on your steel, death in life is your ideal. Life is like a wheel. Oh, so good, so good. I thought he was gonna go the oh 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 oh. <laughs> I know, Sunny. Thank you. Tom, thank you. Shout it out, Loudcast fans. Kiss Army, thank you. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, Sonny, thank you for this pick. Uh, it enlightened me and opened my ears a little bit more to Iron Maiden, so I appreciate this. Uh, so thank you, and thank you, Zeus. Great time, as always, with these bonus episodes. Yeah, definitely a great time, and I will apologize up front to all you listeners. I am very, very sorry about what Zeus is going to pick next. I have absolutely no idea what it is, um, but I'm sorry anyway. Yeah, I, I, I have I have some con- I have a little bit more confidence than Sonny in what Zeus is going to pick. I, I don't know, but we'll find out soon enough. You guys will see. Peace out, Girl Scout. Woo! We love you.